The year is 1973. At this time, disco was killing it. But it will also be in that same exact year where a new genre will start its genesis. That genre that we know today, we call it hip hop. Now, if you know your history, you would know that the five elements of hip hop are MCing, DJing, B boying, and graffitiing, and having historical knowledge of the movement. The birth of hip hop would take place in the Boogie Down Bronx, New York, beginning with pioneers such as DJ Kool Herc and also the world's first MC, Copeland Rock, just to name a few. But as the 70s and disco was coming to an end, this would be the moment when hip hop could begin its evolution. And once the 80s were in effect, we would be given the opportunity to see hip hop in its purest form by watching local MCs grind their way up into superstars. But soon hip hop would spread. It would not only be coming out of the East Coast, we would have an opportunity to see MCs come out of the West and also out of the South. Now, the South has always had its battles within the hip-hop culture, mainly because they always felt like we didn't belong there. Even though everything that's influential back then and now comes directly from the roots of the South. <laughs> Check your history. But one of the most influential places today and back then has to be my hometown, Memphis, Tennessee. Now, there's no doubt that the city has been killing it in the industry for some time now. But... People just don't know. We have a lot of pioneers who crawl, so therefore today's artists could walk and run. But when hip hop entered into the 90s, we will be commercially introduced to a duo who's heavily influenced not only in Memphis, not only in the South, but in hip hop in general. And that group is A Ball and MJG. These gentlemen have been around since the late 80s locally and grinded their way up in the early 90s by making a name for themselves, putting Orange Mound and Memphis 10 on the map. These brothers have sold millions upon millions, made guest appearances on countless gold and platinum albums and movie soundtracks. As a duo, I swear, these guys have a flawless music catalog with eight balls, poetic gutter storytelling, with MJG's potent lyrical ability. It will make anyone say, man, those guys? Huh, I'm talking about those guys? I'm talking about Primrose, Fat Boy, Fat Mac, Big Ball, I'm talking about MJG, Pimp Type, Marlon, Jermaine Goodwin, the group, the duo known as <laughs> A-Ball and MJG, those guys, them dudes, those living legends, <laughs> bruh, it's the only thing you could call them are the real kings of Memphis. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Orange Mound. Now, not only this is the neighborhood that helped raise Ball and G, this was the exact same neighborhood that helped raise me as well. Now, on a year ago on the Ghetto Boys podcast, while describing Orange Mound, MJG said that Orange Mound is basically like its own town. And he wasn't lying. That's why we always referred it to as Orange Mound, Tennessee. Now, of course, Orange Mound has its history for being uh, one of the first black communities in the city, a uh, neighborhood that was built by blacks for blacks. And it always had that family-oriented feeling, especially during the years you know, when I grew up, as far as during the 90s and the 2000s. But don't get me wrong, the mound has always had its ups and downs, just like any other city or neighborhood as far as dealing with crime, gangs, and drugs. But hey, at the end of the day, it's our neighborhood, and it helped shape us into the people that we are today. A-Ball will be born Primrose Smith on October 9th, 1972. MJG will be born Marlon Goodwin on August 31st, 1971. Ball and G was just like any young kids during the 80s once hip-hop burst onto the mainstream. You had groups like Ron DMC at the forefront, and they were quickly inspired. The two would meet in the mid-80s at Ridgeway Middle School during their seventh grade year. Instantly, the two hit it off. Both young men had to catch the city bus, the matter bus, to get 
to and from school every day. So they would end up growing closer. And they also found out they lived in the same neighborhood a couple of streets over from each other. And as the years would pass, they would end up attending the same exact high school, Melrose High. Now, during this time, the young teenagers were becoming inspiring rap artists, competing in local talent shows throughout the city, showing off their lyrical skills. But 8-Ball would be part of a group called Organized Rhymes. But it would be an associate of 8-Ball by the name of Roy Jackson, who would introduce 8-Ball to an individual by the name of Reggie Boylan, who had his own record company at the time called OTS on the Strength Records. This was the home of a few local talents in the city. And Reggie Boylan ended up signing 8 Ball as a solo artist. And at that time, he wasn't 8 Ball. He was going by his government name, Primrose. And as Ball would start recording records for OTS, he would bring in his partner, MJG, to be featured on a song called Lyrics of a Pimp. And that's when Reggie Boylan decided to put Ball and G together as a duo. Now, the two would go on to record the rest of their album, and that underground album would be called Listen to the Lyrics, which would be released in 1991. The single Lyrics of a Pimp would end up getting radio play throughout Memphis and made Ball and G real big names in the city. But as the tape and CDs were selling, Ball and G felt like they weren't getting paid fairly because the album was doing so well locally and their song was on the radio. Now, of course, they didn't understand the business at the time, so of course they had no idea about who had to get paid before they saw any money. And they felt like Reggie was stalling them out. So this would create some animosity between Ball and G and the label owner Reggie Boylan. Now, heading into the fall of 92, a young record label CEO by the name of Tony Draper, who hailed from Houston, Texas, got wind of the noise that listened to the lyrics was making in Memphis and wanted to sign Ball and G to his label Swab House. But there was a problem. Ball and G was still contractually signed to OTS. So Draper, he tried to strike a deal with Reggie to buy Ball and G out of their contracts for $50,000. <laughs> and Reggie wasn't going, he quickly declined because he knew that Ball and G would work way more. Now, according to Reggie, this is how it went down as far as Ball and G end up moving to Houston and signing with Swab House. I sued Swab House. I just let, didn't let them just run off. I could have sued 8-Ball and them, but I didn't. Because they didn't have no money at that time, man. Huh? I went at Schwab. The dude tried off me like 50 racks, 50,000, man. But I didn't want to go on with that. That man just signed for like 15 million, which is universal or whatever, for them boys. Two by the eight ball, and then when he came to the town, he just came in and gave me a tape. Oh, pretty much just scoping out the head, did the work, uh, set up, you know, and just small yeah. talk. But he did call me and asked, him, asked me, could he... Uh, buy him out the contract, but he wanted me to meet him in some neighborhood, and I said, no, nah, we're about to go over there, some shit. I said, no, nah, just meet me at the office, so dude, I waited, you know, I went back to the office and waited, he never showed up, so see, a week later, I heard they was in Texas, <laughs> and I was dead on that, but I heard he gave him some money, about 50, 40, 30, 40,000 or whatever. So, everything was official. Ball and G would end up signing the Swab House Records and they would end up relocating from Memphis, Tennessee to Houston, Texas. Now, when they did relocate, they would end up taking a lot of old school vinyl records with them uh, that they had collected, you know, got from their parents. You know, yeah, I think they come from that, that, that era as far as the 70s and stuff like that. So that's the stuff their parents would listen to and that's what the stuff they grew up on. And they would end up using those records to uh, help produce their Swap House debut album coming out hard. And a lot of people don't know also is Ball and G did a lot of, uh, basically all of the production on coming out hard. So man, shout out to them boys. And also shout out to them uh, because they just celebrated uh, the 30 year anniversary of coming out hard. Because coming out hard came out in August of 1993. And when I say this is a masterpiece, when it comes to albums, this is exactly what it is. There's only nine records on the album, but it's so complete. You know how most artists gotta have a, you know, a million songs or 22 songs to have a classic. No, this is something that goes, you can play straight through, no skips. And I was only four years old when this album came out. So if I have any listeners or viewers who are of age or much older, 
uh, far as when this album came out, man, let me know what the vibes was, especially if you're from Memphis. Like, how was, uh, what were the vibes when this album came out? Like, how impactful was it, man? Like, I know it's, it's, a, it's a lot of people having that, having that album playing in their tape deck, man. I know it is. Coming out hard with basically Catapult, 8 Ball, and MJG into a whole nother stratosphere as far as when it comes to success. And then a year later in 1994, the group would end up releasing their second Swap House de- uh, album, Outside Looking In. But around this time, they would end up being backed by a major label, Relativity Records. And the group was end up seeing the same success as far as, you know, that they, they did with Coming Out Hard. And the single for um, Outside Looking In ended up being Laid Down. And what a lot of people don't know is Laid Down was originally supposed to be on Coming Out Hard, but it didn't make the cut, so they just saved it for this album right here. And that's another classic right there. A lot of people kind of slept on that album too, man. Now, the duo ended up, you know, after having, you know, two uh, successful albums, they sold a bunch of units, uh, they charted, you know, they made a name for themselves as far as uh, in the southern region and also within hip hop. They will end up start working on their third Swap House album, On Top of the World, which dropped in 95. And this is when everything really got cracking for them because this would be their first gold album. And a, a single from this album would be the classic Space Age Pimpin'. I was the lead single featuring the late Nina Crick. And that's been this meme going around on social media saying that Space Age Pimpin' isn't a love song. Shit. Who told you that lie? Like, we, it's damn near like a love song. But all jokes aside, another classic record uh, from another classic album from Ball and G. And I uh, want to pay my respects to the late Nina Crick. She passed a couple of years ago. Uh, if you never heard that song before, um, I, I can't even tell you, like, she didn't uh, understand the assignment. She didn't, like, she overstood it, you know? She overstood it, because not only on the hooks, but just at the end. And, you know, she wasn't singing. She was singing, you know? Uh, she was a very wonderful talent. Uh, she uh, she was a, man, a beautiful, beautiful woman and had just a beautiful singing voice, man. She passed a couple of years ago. And I uh, just want to say rest in peace to her and may her musical legacy continue to live on. Now, in that same year, Bali G will make a guest appearance on Goody Mob's Soul Food album. You know, they had the single Soul Food and they did the remix, which featured Ball and G. And that's another classic album and record right there. If you've never heard it before, you're missing out. And actually, that will end up, you know, gaining Ball and G their second gold plaque within one year. So, just let you know, man, these boys was on the road, man. Now, heading into 1996, they just kept, they kept the guest appearances coming, man. They end up showing up on Masterpiece Down South Hustlers album. Uh, they end up showing up on Tila's hit single, Show Up. And y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. Hoes with no clothes, showing love, shaking that ass in the club, nigga. Like, that's a classic song. And then actually, come to find out in a recent interview that Jazzy Faye did, that he said that Ball and G didn't even originally like it. You know, he had to, you know, kind of slick push them to get on it. It took them a while to get used to the beat and everything. You know, Jazzy Faye, he was on it as far as the hook, and he produced it. That was a really, really big song. I, I was shocked to hear that Bali G didn't even originally like that song. Uh, also, within that same year, they would end up appearing on Mr. Mike's uh, Wicked Ways album on a song called Stop Lying. Stop lying, stop flushing. You gotta stop, yep, start telling the truth. And for those who don't know, Bali G actually produced that song too. They produced that song together. They will also make another guest appearance on uh, Mr. 3 2, Rest in Peace, on his album, The Wicked Buddha Baby. On the song called Hit the Highway, which also featured Too Short. So, you know, they was on the road. You know, they was, uh, they, they living in Houston, but they was putting it down for the city of Memphis, man. They definitely was. Now, heading into 97, um, this would be uh, a, a bigger year for them. 
not only for them, but for Tony Draper and the Swab House label as well, because they would end up signing another deal. Now, I know in the beginning, as uh, far as the audio, you heard uh, Reggie Boylan talking about that, you know, they had got the deal with Universal. No, this is when they, they didn't get the deal with Universal until 97. And this is the deal he was talking about. He ended up signing with Universal for a big distribution deal for like 15 million or whatever like that. And the first album to be released for, for that deal, it would be MJG's debut solo album, No More Glory. Now, we're going to get to that. Uh, we're going to get to Lost, which is A Ball's album. You know, I know a lot of people love that. But if you have never heard MJG's album, No More Glory, oh my God, that is top to bottom a work of art when it comes to just lyricism, uh, when it comes to wordplay, when it comes to substance, when it comes to those like records, like they hit home. And come to find out, the album wasn't even 100% done. I found that out doing my research. No More Glory wasn't even finished because, you know, MJG and Tony Draper ended up bumping heads creatively as far as the album. I guess, you know, MJG wanted to put more. He had more to put on the album. And, you know, Draper like, told him, I guess, no, nah, that's it. So just imagine if No More Glory had more records on it. I think I wouldn't be surprised if it was supposed to be a double disc. Man, but uh, No More Glory ended up being released in November of 97. The first single from that would end up being uh, That Girl featuring uh, Ron Ellis. Ain't it funny how the time is the least slips away? I be thinking about you sugar every moment, every day. Hand me lay up on the beast, we can each get cold that. On the other end, what the people don't know, man, show me. And it the thing that you feel like. Let me know the spot to get you hot and make it feel right. Hey, that song right there still jammed to this day. And I can actually remember watching that video as a kid for the first time because I'm just like anybody else. I'm talking about the 90s Stacey Dash. She was in that video. Uh, I ain't talking about the Stacey Dash we see today. I'm talking about the 90s version. That's the one I'd rather, you know, talk about right there. She was just so bad, man. Uh, I still remember watching that video so many times. And before we jump off into 1998, uh, also that same year, Ball and G will release another classic song, which will end up coming out on the Swab House compilation album. And the single was Just Like Candy. Man, uh, just listen to that um, song right there. You know, especially during the summertime, it gives you that summertime vibe. It definitely do, man. If you never check that song out, man, play it. Especially like on a Saturday when you just got your wheel banged up coming from, like coming from the car wash, you didn't got fresh, you riding around the city. Like, man, it's definitely that vibe for you, even in 2023. Now, after the release of No More Glory, which eventually end up going gold, and six months later, Swap House and Universal end up releasing A Ball's first solo album which will be called Lost and you gotta think 1998 was one of the greatest years of uh, ever as far as hip hop albums y'all already know what I'm talking about and for 8 Ball to release an album a double disc album like this a classic with all the features he had on there man 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 a lot of people put Lost up there with the, one of the greatest double disc albums of all time as far as Life After Death All Eyes On Me and I can't argue with that I can't find any lies in, t in that statement man um, the two singles from the Lost album will end up being My Homeboy's Girlfriend, which was actually an underrated song and video. Y'all go check that out. And Pure Uncut featuring Psycho Drama, Master P, Mystical, and Sip the Shocker. And that was a real posse cut. That was like the first video I saw uh, from this album. And all I can remember that chant, Swap House, No Limit Soldiers. Like, that was my jam right there. And I actually like the way that Tony Draper and Universal end up dropping this uh, album because it was, like I said, it was originally a double disc. And uh, I probably like two months later after this, they would add a third disc to it, which was another Swap House compilation album. 
And this is how they was able to sell like 1.5 million copies of this album. So 8-Ball was able to go platinum. Like that right there was big. You know what I'm saying? Uh, He was everywhere at that time. He was definitely everywhere at that time. If you have never checked out the Lost album, and you got to think, he had Busta Rhymes on that album. He had Redman on that album. Of course, you got MJG on there. Like, you got to have his partner on there. But it's just like, uh, we had Crazy Bone on there. Uh, he had just had a lot. Of, I think Naughty by Nature was on there. Like, man, he had a um, hell of a lot of people on there, man. But that album was definitely always on point. Now, Heading into 1999, you got to think, with all the success that Ball and G has had uh, on their own, far as uh, their projects together and their solo work, and not to mention, or not to mention all the features that they have done, going into 99, you would think that most. Uh, you would thought they would fell off musically because it happens to a lot of individuals when it comes to having a gaining a lot of success. They end up falling off lyrically or musically, and that was not the case for Ball and G, because after all the success they had gained, hey, they kept they kept the ball rolling. Uh, their last album on Swab House, this was their last album contractually. In our lifetime volume one and it actually ended up becoming their first charting uh number one album you know it hit number one uh on the uh rap album charts and like i said it was their last album on suave house so they was able to close the door uh on you know just you know dealing with suave house and stuff like that because you know people just don't know that you know tony draper did not treat ball and g fair i'm just gonna say that he did not treat them fair you know, and I'm hoping that, you know, they're still fighting, trying to get the ownerships to all the stuff they released on uh, Suave House. Uh, I hope they're able to get what's rightfully owed to them because, you know, I understand there was a lot of artists on Suave House, but come on now. We all know Ball and G was a flagship artist. They were the ones that was moving the units. They were the ones who was putting the plaques up on the wall, man, for real, for real. And I'm just being honest. Now, in our lifetime, end up going gold. And that was their last album on Suave House. And that was another classic album. Um, The single was We Started This. And I remember watching that video as a kid and I quite didn't understand it. You know, being a 10-year-old child, I didn't really understand it. But you go look at at it now, it's more important back then than it is. uh, It was more important now than it was back then. Because of the message in the video, man. Go check that video out. Like, damn, I had just watched it while doing my research for this. It's like, wow, this hit home today than it did back then. You got to think, that dropped in 99. Mm -mm -mm. Now, also around this same time, uh, right as they was uh, leaving Swab House, 8-Ball would uh, start his own label, 8 Ways Entertainment. And, you know, he was getting his CEO on. And uh, I think he ended up dropping a, a... compilation album called The Slab. It was a few artists he was working with at the time. And, you know, but just go back to that In Our Lifetime um, Volume 1. You know, of course, you got um, Paid Dudes featuring Solo, uh, CeeLo, uh, Throw Your Hands Up featuring Outkast, which is a very underrated posse cut. Um, Daylight, I love Daylight, and my favorite one is Nobody But Me. And the reason why that song right there uh, is one of my favorites because, you know, they just tell you that, you know, it's cool to be yourself. You don't have to be what others want you to be or try to push you to be. And it's not only in the music industry, man. That was in less in life. And that's the one of the reasons why Ball and G will always be my favorites. Because look at the messages they was pushing within their music. It wasn't all about pimping. It wasn't all about, you know, living in the ghetto and things like that, man. They was pushing real messages in their songs. And, you know, it's just that's just how it was and always will be with Ball and G. For real, for real. Now, after this, uh, Ball and G would end up inking a deal with J-Core Entertainment slash Interscope, and they would end up working on another album, which was called Space Age Forever. And that album would end up dropping in November of 2000, with the uh, first single being Pimp Hard, Pimp Harder. And I remember when that first dropped, I was 11 at the time, and that shit still bumped to this day, man, just going through their catalog. And uh, the second single ended up being uh, Bug Bounce, featuring and produced by DJ Quick. And if you have never heard MJG's verse on that 
song right there, you are slipping. Like how he started off. I'm going to kill him with the mic. Before I get bucked with the gun, one nine seven two with the birth of a nigga with a verse. You can't fuck with the one, nigga. Taking foot out your mouth, get your ass out the couch. MJG bringing the heat when quick drop this beat. I know they call it rap, but I'ma rock this beat. Breaking them off for this, a little bit of dose of this. The coast to coast hit when I wrote the shit and took the pen, kept on smoking in and put it down on tape again. Like, oh my fucking god, like who raps like this? Well, of course MJG, but who, like that's what I'm saying. Could nobody fuck with them dudes on the mic, man? Oh my god. Now Space Age Forever has some. Uh, had a couple of favorites of mine on there. Uh, things featuring Jazzy Faye and uh, T.I.'s wife, Tiny. Uh, she said, oh, she sung the hell out that song. Like, things we used to do, we can't do no more. Uh, the song Collard Greens was actually produced by MJG. They go, they went hard on it. Now, the only problem I had with this Space Age Forever album was the production from Swiss Beats. Now, I know a lot of people put Swiss Beats on their high pedestal when it comes to production and things like that. But me, personally, I've never been a Swiss fan uh, outside of the Rough Riders. I feel like that's what he was meant for. Like, when producing for DMX and for the Locks and Dragon, that's different. But he he didn't mesh well as far as the A-Ball and MJG sound. And I feel like Ball and G can damn near rap to anything, but I just feel like the production, I didn't like it. I did not like it. So, but Space Age Forever, it did well, but it didn't do well to get like a gold or a platinum plaque. So, um, you know, they ended up leaving um, Interscope. Now, I think they, um, I think MJG, he ended up leaving J Core and Interscope. And what ended up happening was A Ball remained on J Core. Uh, and so he ended up getting a solo deal. In 2001, Ibal will release his second solo album called Almost Famous with the single Stop Playing Games featuring Diddy. Stop playing games, ho. Oh. It's about that money you making. Stop playing games, ho. Oh. Ain't nothing about that talking to faking. Uh, man, that was right there. That was a good That was a good album right there. Hey, you know, uh, I think it sold up uh, probably like 400,000 copies, you know, so A-Ball was still able to sell a bunch of records on his own, man. But a little bit of, a little bit after that album right there, J-Core Entertainment uh, ended up like defunding, so it was kind of over with. So A-Ball just went on his, uh, his separate ways, you know, just doing his eight ways entertainment. And uh, a little bit after that, this is when Ball and G will be featured on the uh, Saga Continues album, the Bad Boy uh, compilation album, whatever. And that was on the song called Ride With Me featuring Faith Evans. And if you have never listened to that song right there, that's another vibe type of song right there. Mm -mm -mm. Please go check that out. And I think, uh, you know, yeah, I think Ball and G had been, you know, working with Bad Boy for a while. You know, even after they wasn't with Tony Draper anymore. And I think this is what made the relationship between Bad Boy and the guys much stronger. And it was a little bit after this. This is when Ball and Z will be presenting, you know, a new opportunity. At the time, Diddy was starting up Bad Boy South. And of course, who would he sign to kick this division off, this new division off, because he saw what was going on with Def Jam South, the success they had with Ludacris, and, you know, other uh, labels was making the Southern division as well, because the South was definitely taking over around this time. Like, we had the South, you know what I'm saying, the South was already dominant as far as Cash Money and Master P, but it was just like a new generation who kicked down the doors. It's right, especially around that crunk era. So he ended up signing Ball and G uh, to a Bad Boy South in 2003, and their first release would be in 2004, would be the album Living Legends. Now, who remember that album? Who remember that album? I definitely do, because the summer of 2004, it was just something about that, man. If I had the opportunity to just rewind time, I would go back. Like, for music at that time, like, it was just everything about that year was just so, just so fun, man. Just the summer, just the whole entire year, but especially the summer. This album came out in May of 2004. It was a week after my birthday, I remember. And, of course, they had the energetic record, You Don't Want Drama. And I remember how the city reacted, you know, seeing Ball and G make their comeback. Because you got to think, they didn't drop an album since together since 99. 1999. It was five years. 
Well, no, I'm sorry. Four years because it was uh, 2000 with the other album, uh, Space Age Pimpin'. They haven't dropped the album in four years. So people, the city went crazy for that. Seeing them with Diddy and stuff like that. And then how they kicked it off. Uh, far as with the You Don't Want Drama. I, I remember when they premiered it on uh, 106 in Park. And it kept going up on the video countdown and everything, man. I remember. Now, um, that album ended up being their highest charting album. You know, on both charts. As far as the uh, Billboard 200 and the R&B and Hip Hop charts. And the two singles from that of course, You Don't Want Drama, and the other second classic single, Forever, featuring Lloyd. Now, I know y'all remember Lloyd's uh, part on that, that song right there. Like, he killed that hook, and I think that made that gave some extra spotlight to Lloyd. Like, being able to be on the street record like that, and, you know, being that co-sign with uh, some legendary figures, uh, with A-Ball and MJG, like, I, you can still go back to that uh, record right now and just let it play through right there. But that album has some fucking heat on it. You know, The Streets uh, featuring Bun B. Uh, you Didn't Shot Off. What else it was on there? Um, yeah, You Didn't Shot Off featuring Ludacris. Uh, when It's On. Uh, I'm Trying to Get At You. And now uh, featuring 112. I think that should have been a single. That, I think that would have helped the album go platinum. They, uh, the album out today is like an 800,000 copies sold. Is that gold? But I think, you know, that female record would have helped A-Ball and MJG go platinum. They, I'm trying to get at you, baby. With 112, that shit right there was bumping. Uh, and another, one of my favorite records on that is Confessions featuring Pooh Bear, the producer Pooh Bear. Hustling, waiting on tomorrow. Ma. Living in a away. Cause no one ever knows. I know I can't sing, but that right there was, oh my God, it was the last record too. It's called Confessions. Um, go, man, if you never heard this song right there, man, go check it out. Man, Living Legends was definitely like that comeback album for Ball and G. That's exactly what they needed. And they, they was able to get the uh, momentum back right there, man. Now, the guys wouldn't drop another album on Bad Boy until 2007, but before we get into that, uh, they was keeping it going as far as their mixtape appearances, uh, or their mixtape work and guest appearances. You know, they was dropping gangster grills and shit like that. And in 2005, they would be featured on a number one hit single with Stay Fly, feet with Three Six Mafia and Young Buck. And seeing them perform that at the verses, at the balling, uh, the uh, Three Six Mafia versus Bone Thugs and Harmony verses, and they just had that bitch lit. They did, and when, and then of course y'all, come on now, MJG, when he got to his verse, it was like church in there. Like a lot of people say, like it was like the cheat code right there. They he, they had they had MJG. When they brought A-Ball and MJG out there, man, it was just over with, man. I, I was just in my I was in my living room just hyped for that, man. But Stay, uh, Stay Fly ended up um ended up uh, going and it was a number one single. I remember when that dropped as well in the summer of 2005. Now in 2006, uh Ball and G would end up signing their own group out of Memphis. It was called the Volunteers. They was from Orange Mound. Uh, J Rock, aka Rock Dylan, and 12 Noon. And they had this song called What's Your Favorite Color? Orange and Where You From, Mound. Uh, I remember when that first popped off. Like, it was getting hella uh, radio play in the city. Um, I remember when they shot the video uh, at Orange Mound Detailing on Park Avenue. Man, they just had the, uh, they had the ringtones as well. They had the ring. And not to mention, they had a solid album. You know, that What's Your Favorite Color from the Volunteers, that was a solid album, especially their other song, Shine. Uh, so, shout out to them boys, man, for the, for the Volunteers. Now, heading into 2007, this will be their seventh album uh, overall, but will be their last album on Bad Boy called Riding Hot. Now, doing my research, I found out that uh, the album was scheduled to come out in 2006, and the original title for that album was called Pure American Pimpin'. And it was changed. It got pushed back and everything got changed. I'm pretty sure Ball and G probably had a whole nother album recorded. I'm pretty sure Diddy or whoever made them go back and record a whole nother album. And, you know, no, and no disrespect to the guys. You know, I love them. 
Like, they were my favorite rap group of all time, but Riding High was not my favorite Ball and G album. It wasn't. And, you know, it's because I understand Diddy was the executive producer. It's his label, but it was too much of his input on it. And I feel like when you're dealing with a group like A-Ball and MJG, there's okay to have certain inputs as far as being an executive producer, but I feel like, you know, he should have let them do them. You know, as far as they know what they want. And I know he wanted to, them to be more commercial, especially at a time when the industry the industry was changing. This is 2007. This is when ringtone rap was at it, like was basically popping. Far as Soldier Boy, Hurricane Chris, and a lot of uh, like the snap moving, like snap your fingers was going off and all this type of stuff. So I understand why Diddy would want like a more commercial feel to it, but I feel like there should have been a balance, you know. A, and I think he should have let, you know, Ball and G put more input to it. You can tell when Diddy is, you know, when it's uh, a lot of his input on his albums. Like, I've listened to enough of his artist albums to know when he uh, he basically had all his input in it. Uh, Riding High, it wasn't, not, it was like not their best-selling album. So, you know, and like I said, it wasn't my favorite Ball and G album. So, uh, I like the single Riding High. Um, I think Hickory Dickory was on there. So, it was an okay album. And like I said, it wasn't my favorite. But it'll be another three years before the guys would end up dropping another album. And um, they would end up signing to T.I.'s label, Grand Hustle. Now, before they even end up, you know, getting into that deal, MJG ended up releasing um, a solo album in 2008 called Pimp Type. And he released it on this label called Real Talk Entertainment. And Real Talk Entertainment was one of those labels that would buy up uh, old songs from artists who they, they're, they're not using it and, you know, pay them for it and then turn, like, you know, basically release them as albums and get paid for it, which I can't get mad at MJG for that shit. Get that bad. But 8-Ball kept it going as far as on this 8 Ways Entertainment label. He was collaborating with a lot of uh, local artists out the city and he was dropping his uh, solo tapes uh, as far as an as independent artist. As a solo independent artist, he was dropping this shit. I remember uh, the bomb. Um, he dropped. He, dro- he dropped a lot of stuff during that time, man. But you know, hey, they kept the ball rolling, whether it was together or solo wise. But they end up inking the deal with Grand Hustle and E1, and I think Atlantic was involved with it too. And you know, I'm not in their business. You know, I don't know what was their financial status at the time, but I always feel like Ball and G were too big of an artist and too legendary to constantly having to sign under other people. That's just my opinion. You know, like I said, I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know what was going down. But I just felt like, you know, man, I just I just feel like they was just too big to just constantly sign under other, under other people's imprints. That's just my opinion. Um, the album ended up coming out in 2010 called Ten Toes Down. Uh, they had the single uh, 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 Sound Like Money featuring Young Dro. A lot of people didn't like that single. It was okay. It was okay. A lot of people did not like that single. You know, but uh, it got a lot of radio play. It definitely got a lot of radio play. But my favorite song on that album would end up being Life Goes On featuring Drummer Boy and produced by Drummer Boy and for a little Pat Slim Thug on there. And that, sh- that record right there still hit home. If you've never heard that song, go check it out, please. Especially MJG's verse. Oh, my God. A-Ball killed it, too, and Slim Thug did his thing. But MJG, like, he, he, he brought the message home. You know, and then A Bob did too. He said, "You got all the latest guns. You got eighty niggas with you, but if niggas wanna get you, best believe they'll hit you." Mm mm mm. Now, what's crazy is while I'm doing this uh, research for this, realize that this was A Bob and MJG's last album they have ever put out, 2010, and we are in 2023, and it's just crazy because. You know, you will, you will, you want more. Uh, we want more music from them. Like they still release videos and singles and stuff like that. They even got the live album, Classic Pimping. Go check that out. I like that. I remember watching them on Facebook Live as they was. Um, I think like did like a live concert or whatever like that. This was, I want to say this around the pandemic. But you know, I was like, damn, they haven't dropped the album since then. And well, you know what's crazy? 
they don't even have to. You know, as much and as bad we would like another A-Ball and MJG album, they actually don't even have to do that. Why? It's because that catalog alone is just ridiculous. Not for solo work or do or their duo stuff, their guest features and stuff like that. Come on now. Yeah, I think they're on tour now. They've been on tour for the past 10 years. Now. You know, Rock and these Clowns came out in 1999. Rocking these clubs, rocking these, uh, uh, these venues, going to these festivals and stuff like that because they're just that legendary. You know? They're just that legendary. Like, in my opinion, you know, I love UGK. I love Outkast. I love Goody Mob. I love Poison Clan. I love Ghetto Boys. I love, um, I love Danny, every, uh, every dope group out of far as in hip hop, man. You know, I love the locks. You know, I love all that, but man, A-Ball and MJG will always be number one to me. And I'm gonna do some uh some manifesting like before I end this man. I'm gonna act like I'm speaking to A Ball and MJG right now, you know, because uh, I'm, I'm hoping that they see this or someone from Push Management see this. And I'm gonna act like I'm talking to them right now. To A Ball and MJG, I just want to take the opportunity and say thank you, thank you to every, thank you for everything that you've contributed to hip hop. Thank you. To, uh, for everything that you've contributed to the Memphis music scene. Thank you for contributing a lot to my childhood and a lot of our childhoods because y'all helped raise us as far as the music. You know, you guys will always be number one. I understand you guys are humble. You guys, you know, with all the success, with all the records that you guys sold, you guys have been everywhere. Yeah, I think these guys have toured in other countries as well. You know, going to Japan and stuff like that. And they got a shitload of plaques from being on guest appearances and stuff. But in my in my opinion... And I feel like that's what's truly missing in today's hip hop, in my opinion. You do have some artists who probably do that, but they're more underground. But man, in my opinion, you don't have enough artists who talk about the, the subject matters that Ball and G was speaking on, man. Like for real, for real. And it's just, I'm sorry. Can't nobody fuck with 8 Ball and MJG, the most underrated group of all time, dude. Go look at their catalogs. Go look at they, they, they stacks. Can't nobody fuck with them dudes. Can't nobody fuck with them. Yeah, these dudes are untouchable lyrically. You know what I'm saying? Music wise. Just the catalog is there. And it just, and then that, that's my whole reason for doing this video because I want to have the opportunity to give, you know, these guys their flowers because they deserve it. They get they respect it everywhere they go, you know. You know, I've never heard anyone say anything bad about A Ball and MJG. And this and I feel like this is this is who I feel like artists should want to be like. Cause these guys are the definitions of longevity. These are the these guys are the definition of what legend living legends look like. This is legendary status. Yeah, I think they first came out in 91. We are in 2023. And they still doing it. You know, and I'm not saying this because we I'm from the same neighborhood as them or I'm from the same city from, uh, as them. But I'm saying it because it's true. I'm saying it because it's from the heart. Thank you, Ball and G. This is the reason why I've done this video. This is my way of saying thank you for everything you all have done. And I hope and pray that you all get everything that's owed to y'all far as uh, financial-wise. Because in my opinion, like, you guys should be up there. You know, I'm not trying to even catch y'all pockets. And, you know, I don't know what you all have. But, and I know you guys ain't never, never been, you know, the flashy type. You guys ain't never been like that. But I feel like you guys deserve it because of what you all have brought to the game, you know. 
You guys are like these are childhood friends. These are brothers. You never heard them beefing. You, and if they did beef, they kept it within their group. They kept it in the family. You know? So I just want to say thank you all. Thank you, Ball and G. I will, you all will forever be the number one group in my eyes. Can't nobody fuck with y'all, man. Uh, let me know in the comment section uh, what's your favorite Ball and G album, uh, your favorite Ball and G song. Uh, when was the first time you ever heard Ball and G? Uh, just let me know in the comment section, man. I just hope y'all enjoyed this as much as I, yeah, you know, making this. And also, um, I will, at the end of this, I will be, you know, just putting up the list of all their guest appearances because I couldn't put them all in the damn video, man. I'm going to also put up their catalogs as far as their, all their albums and their mixtapes, man. Uh, thank you all for checking out this episode right here of The Music Journey. My name is...